Greetings, this is Greg. This is going to be a completely unscripted, shooting from the hip, non-technical video with a bit of a personal story in it, so it's quite a bit different from my normal content. In a recent video, I mentioned that there are a lot of underrated British accomplishments and equipment from World War II. The opposite is true as well. A lot of the stuff is overrated. This tends to be true for World War II airplanes from all nations, but for some reason, I think it's more so for the British stuff. That remark I made caused a fair number of comments, and the most common was asking me for an example of something British that I don't think gets enough recognition. That's easy. Uh, there's a lot of things, but specifically, there's a British plane that I think is highly underrated. This underrated British airplane flew from around the time of the Battle of Britain until the end of the war. Seventy RAF pilots became aces while flying this airplane, and it stayed in service with the RAF until 1960, and that was a long time back then. The plane was operated not only by the RAF, but by Australians and the U.S. as well as numerous other countries, especially in the post-war period. It saw service in Europe during the war, as well as the Mediterranean, Burma, and in the Pacific, and it performed well in all theaters, yet it's rarely mentioned. You're probably trying to guess what plane I'm talking about, and that's good. And as you think about it, I want to tell you about a time I met a World War II RAF veteran that flew this plane. Now, we're going back to about 1976, so I would have been 10 years old, but it could have been 77 or 78 when I was 11 or 12. I really can't remember the exact date. Uh, my father worked for some computer company. He worked for several throughout his career, and I can't remember which one he worked for at this particular time, but it was probably either Burroughs or Memorex. My dad was in sales, and that meant something a little bit different back then. At that time, salesmen for those sort of companies had to have a huge amount of technical knowledge about the products. There was no internet, so potential customers couldn't just look things up. So if a potential customer, uh, for example, a, a big corporation like an airline, wanted a reservation system or something else that required computing power, they would contact one of these companies, which would then send someone like my dad to meet up and uh, explain to them the product line and try and make the sale. Usually, the first part of these meetings entailed figuring out what the customer wanted and then if it was something that was even possible to deliver. If it was, from there it was just a normal sales job, explaining why your product is better than the other guys, working out pricing, and, and so on. So my dad had a sales call at Ravel in Venice Beach, California, which was not too far from where I grew up. Ravel was, uh, and still is, a company that makes plastic models, airplanes, planes, uh, tanks, whatever. I was really into building plastic models at the time. It seemed like everybody I knew was, every boy anyway. I recently read that at the peak of the plastic modeling hobby in the 1960s, something like 80% of boys built models on a somewhat regular basis. At this point, in the 1970s, it was probably still around 50%. It's hard for kids today to understand just how big this was, so I'll explain it this way. Every grocery store carried plastic models made by Ravel, Monogram, and the other big companies of the day. So did the drugstores. I personally liked the kits from Ravel, so when I heard my dad was going to their factory, I begged to go with him, and thankfully he took me. By the way, these are just generic pictures of models that were copyright free. Uh, this one is of the USS Tanny, the only ship that was at Pearl Harbor on the day of the attack that's still afloat. I've been on it several times, have a lot of pictures of it. I might include a quickie video tour of it at the end of another video uh, someday. Back to our story. We got there to the Ravel factory, and we were met by a secretary who took us up to the office of the man who I think was the president of the company at the time. I don't know what his official title was, but he was the big guy running the show. I've made efforts to determine what his name was, but these have been unsuccessful. Ravel is still in business, but they've gone through several buyouts and mergers and that sort of thing. 
Plus, it seems to be impossible to contact anybody that works there. There's no phone number or email address on their website that I could find. As soon as I walked into uh, this man's office, I realized he was an RAF pilot from World War II. You could tell by the pictures on the wall. He flew three aircraft during the war, and one of those is the plane I'm saying is highly underrated. It's the Bristol Bowfighter. You probably weren't guessing that one. Maybe a small percentage of you were. Now, he also flew the Spitfire and the Mosquito. He did not like the Spitfire, which I found shocking. At this point in my life, I had read every book on the subject of World War I and World War II airplanes that was available in my school's library, and I don't think I had ever read a single negative thing about the Spitfire. But he articulated very clearly why he didn't like it, and unfortunately I can't remember many details of the conversation. I do remember that he hated the landing gear. He said it was barely okay during normal conditions, but if the pilot was wounded or the plane damaged, it just became a nightmare to deal with. None of his criticism involved the plane's performance or flying qualities. I do remember that. I just don't remember the specifics of his other criticisms, but I suspect they centered around the aircraft's systems. This discussion made me realize that there were a lot more to these airplanes than what I was reading in the books from my grade school library. Now, he had nothing but praise for the Mosquito, but mostly he talked about the Bowfighter. It was clear to me that he thought very highly of the plane. He really loved the Bowfighter. Uh, however, the adults in the room only had so much patience for my curiosity, and eventually the conversation had to turn to business. That actually didn't go very far. It turned out that what Ravel wanted was what we today would call a handheld 3D scanner. I remember what my father told him. My dad said that to his knowledge, such a device did not exist and that he was certain that if it did exist, it did not exist within his company's product line. So uh, that ended that. I mean, the meeting ended on good terms. You know, if we ever have your needs, we'll call you again, that sort of thing. Now, when it was time to go, uh, the old RAF pilot gave me a 132nd scale P-38 Lightning. And understand, that was a big gift. That was an expensive model at the time. By expensive, meaning... It was probably like $8 when most of the 132nd scale models were about 4 bucks, and I was getting paid $0.50 cents to mow a lawn. So um, that was kind of a big deal. And I really lovingly built that model, and I put a lot of effort into it. Of course, I no longer have it. On the way out, we got the full tour of the place, um, and it was impressive. They had blueprints of just all kinds of airplanes and tanks and ships and everything else. They had research people. They had an actual factory. They built the models right there. None of this, you know, we've got an office downtown and a factory in China stuff. They, they actually made all their models. And of course, they had a lot of incredibly well-built models in display cases. Even the cafeteria was full of displayed, professionally built models. It was uh, really an impressive thing for a 10 to 12 year old to visit. Now, back to the Bowfighter. Nothing about it in terms of its performance is stellar. It's not bad, but it's middle of the road in most respects, kind of like a Douglas A-20. The plane's strength seems to be in that it has no serious vices. It's rugged and reliable, carries a lot of firepower, and it's versatile. It operated as a day fighter, night fighter, bomber, and torpedo bomber, and uh, a few other odd things. British Coastal Command used them in an anti-shipping role to great effect. One Coastal Command strike group operating from the RAF base at North Coates sank 117 ships flying bowfighters. That's half the ship sunk by all the strike wings between 1942 and the end of the war. Now, they lost 120 bowfighters and 241 crew members doing it, but... The sad math of warfare is that a one-for-one -one trade, plane to ship, it's a good deal. It's also an impressive statistic, as there were enemy aircraft, anti-aircraft fire, weather, basically every threat a plane could encounter, and it still managed to do pretty well. Remember that those loss numbers include all of those other sorts of uh, losses. Now, over in the Pacific, bow fighters flown by Australians 
played a very important role in the Battle of the Bismarck Sea. During early March 1943, the Japanese were trying to dis they were trying to send troops and supplies from Rabaul to Ley, New Guinea. They were trying to reinforce their forces on New Guinea. The convoy they sent consisted of eight destroyers, eight troop transports, had an escort of about a hundred fighter planes, mostly Zeros, and the Allies attacked the convoy with a variety of planes, including A-20 Havocs, bow fighters, uh, B-25 Mitchells, and uh, also they attacked with PT boats, which actually sank at least one of the transports, I think only one. An Australian war photographer named Damien Perrer rode in one of the bow fighters and took this picture. Furthermore, he filmed a lot of the battle, and you can find the footage of the battle on YouTube. I'll put a link in the description, or you can search for Bismarck Convoy Smashed. That's the name of the little mini war documentary uh, propaganda sort of thing they put together using his footage. Pretty interesting. Anyhow, the Allies sunk all the transports in the convoy. I believe all but one uh, sunk by aircraft. The bow fighters were delegated the dangerous strafing duty to suppress the ship's anti-aircraft fire. And this strafing was horrifyingly effective. The Japanese thought the bow fighters were coming in for torpedo attacks and turned into the bow fighters, which allowed the plane to strafe the entire length of the ship in a single pass. The bow fighters carried four Hispano Suiza 20mm forward firing cannons. I have an episode in my P-47 series coming up that deals with uh, firepower, and we talk a lot about different types of guns. So I'm not going to go too far into this right now, but just know that the Hispano 20mm is a very effective weapon. It was one of the best airborne guns of the war, um, arguably the best. Furthermore, some of the Australian planes had an additional four 50 caliber Browning machine guns, which are nothing to sneeze at. I'm not sure, however, if those were on the planes used in this battle. I did look that up. Uh, I couldn't find out anything either way. Now, the Allied victory here was incredibly lopsided. Only six Allied aircraft were lost. One of them was a bow fighter, and it was lost in some sort of accident. It wasn't even a combat loss. There were 13 Allied casualties, 13, versus over 2,800 for the Japanese, not to mention the big-picture strategic victory of preventing the Japanese from reinforcing New Guinea. So, the bow fighter was successful as a coastal command day fighter. It was successful as a night fighter, ground attack aircraft, and in anti-shipping um, in the Mediterranean, the Pacific, and Burma. It was really a success everywhere it went. You can't say that about some of the more successful, or correction, some of the more famous airplanes. Um, for example, the P-38 Lightning was never truly successful over Germany. The Spitfire wasn't successful in the Pacific or when used by the Soviets on the Eastern Front. Now, there are reasons for those lacks of success, and maybe I'll talk about those in another video another time, but the bow fighter doesn't need any reasons. It doesn't need any excuses. It showed up, did its job well, and for some reason it just doesn't get the respect it deserves. That's all for now. I'm going to get back to my normal video format for the next video. Uh, I've added a Teespring link for shirts and coffee cups and the like to help keep this channel going. Have a great day, and I hope to see your comments below. Goodbye.